Thanks for joining us on the Cultured Meat and Future Food Show. I'm your host, Alex Shirazi, and today we're speaking with Dennis Kent of Prolific Machines. We talk about the story that inspired the company, as well as about challenges in the cultured meat industry. Whether this is your first time listening to the show, or if you've been with us before, we'd like to thank you. Please rate or review the show, but most importantly, share it with friends that you think might find the show interesting. For this episode, we're live in downtown San Francisco at the Prolific Machines offices. Dennis, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. So I'm really excited about doing a live recording because this actually might be one of the first few live recordings since kind of pandemic. And so tell us where we are right now. We are currently at Indie Bio on Jesse Street and the Tenderloin. Wonderful neighborhood. Great. <laughs> yeah, if, if you've been here before, you know the flavor of the neighborhood. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I would say that Indie Bio itself has kind of been upgraded. Like we're in kind of a super futuristic like booth now. When did you and your team get here? We got here uh, last year. It was the middle of the pandemic. There was no one here. It's basically just us and Poe. And that was a travel ban. Oh, wow. But hustled away over here with a travel exemption and... I arrived here and it was desolate. Wow. <laughs> where, where did you arrive here from? London. London. Oh, wow. Okay. Tell us about your background. Yeah. So my background's in cell biology and immunology. So prior to starting Prolific, I was in academia doing my PhD. I was doing it at King's College. I had two projects. One of them was trying to understand how the liver regenerates. So the liver has this super interesting capacity because you can cut off half your liver and it will regrow and people still aren't sure why or how and people have hypothesized that there must be some interesting stem cell biology happening but no one had really interrogated it in a human setting rigorously so i was doing a lot of single cell rna sequencing on human fetal liver and identified a stem cell population spent four years characterizing that stem cell population it was a pretty cool project the other part of my my work was doing the world's first high throughput screen on ips derived hepatocytes <coughs> And that was interesting. We're trying to solve a liver disease called alpha-1-S trypsin deficiency. Found some interesting targets. Uh, taught me a lot about stem cell biology generally. Prior to that, I was working in industry at GlaxoSmithKline. I was working on a one-dose cure for asthma. So yeah, the idea was like, instead of having an inhaler every day, what if you could just have an injection once and that mm. would cure you of your asthma? And that was a pretty cool project, but I hated the bureaucracy of being in a giant conglomerate where nothing ever gets done. and all these committees and subcommittees and if you have a good idea and you're on the bottom it's like tough shit that yeah. idea is never going to come to fruition so that yeah. was that was yeah. kind of like my first realization that maybe small organizations have an advantage over large organizations prior to that i was working in the cancer immunotherapy space i was studying a protein called adenosine and seeing whether we could adenosine is this protein that can inhibit t-cell responses so tumors are regulated and so i was looking at whether we could block adenosine uh, and co-administer that with a car t-cell treatment to improve the efficacy of these car t-cells so my background's in immunology and cell biology but to be honest most of my days uh, currently spent convincing rich people to not buy a second yacht and save the world instead. <laughs> as as the founder and CEO of a startup. Co-founder. Yeah. Co-founder. Right. <laughs> so this is a, a podcast about food, right? Of right. course, cultured meat, future food. You have a heavy medical background, which is where the cultured meat industry came about. Mm -hmm. So how did you make that transition to food or maybe even as early as when did you first start thinking about cultured meat? It was in the first year of my PhD. I went into academia with these dreams of becoming a professor. And I had, you know, in my head, it was this beautiful place where people were doing this amazing science and it was all altruistic and wonderful. But then when I actually got to academia, I became quite disillusioned with how poorly a lot of the science was being done, how cut for it was. It was this real, like, publish or perish mentality that was leading to a lot of bad science happening that I found incredibly disheartening. And around about that time, I'm Turkish. So my family lives on the southeast side of Turkey, a place called Antioch. And around about that time, the Syrian refugee crisis was happening. So I had 600,000 Syrian refugees came into my hometown. And my hometown is only 120,000 people. So this is like the, the biggest thing to happen to my hometown in the last you know 100 years. Wow. And 
So my mom quit her job, started working for the Danish Refugee Council, which is this charity doing amazing work. I took a break from my PhD, went over to Antioch to help my mom. From London? From London. Wow. And I started interacting with these refugees and learning about their problems and how difficult refugee crises, crises can be. Around about the same time, the UN published their climate report saying that by 2050, there'll be somewhere between 300 million and a billion climate refugees. And that number scared the shit out of me because I was looking at a 600,000 refugee crisis. And like when you're looking at 600,000 people, it's like that's a totally unmanageable number of refugees. So the idea of 300 million plus uh, is super scary for me. And right. I basically not convinced that the world is at all prepared for a humanitarian crisis of that magnitude. And I think that if there is going to be a World War Three, I think a climate change induced mass refugee crisis is probably the most likely trigger in my mind, because what are, what are all these millions of people going to do? They're going to be desperate. There's going to be a rise of extremism, rise of terrorism. Lots of countries will close their borders. What are those people? It's going to like the geopolitical turmoil that that would cause, I think, is often overlooked and people just aren't thinking about it. And so all of this to say, I became very interested in refugees and trying to reduce the number of future refugees. And obviously, I was not working on anything related to refugees because I was <laughs> trying to solve these liver diseases. And I, I, I kind of sunk into a deep depression because I was like, am I really helping at all? You know, even if my, all this research goes super well and I find a cure for these liver diseases, does that actually make this situation better? And I was su super concerned about the fact that it might actually make the situation worse, which is that if I'm actually helping, you know, rich people live longer, maybe that, that then just re increases the amount of greenhouse gases that people are going to release and then in turn increases the amount of sea level rises and extreme weather in turn increases the amount of refugees. So I had a sort of existential crisis that maybe I was actually not doing good and started wanting to try and use my skills in stem cell biology to work on planetary health. And I was really thinking about my life as a Venn diagram where if, if one of the circles is this refugee catastrophe that needs to be avoided and the other circle is my experience in stem cell biology, like where is the overlap between those two fields? And that led me to cultured meat. And initially I just wanted to get a job at a cultured meat company. I was like, I, mean, I think I'll be able to add value, I understand how stem cells work. And I spoke to a couple of the cultured meat companies just because I had friends in my network that could connect me. And I knew enough about stem cells to ask the right questions. And one of the questions that I kept asking was, what was your solution to the recombinant protein problem? Because I was aware from my own research that these proteins were ridiculously expensive. And I was also aware that you needed them to grow stem cells. So I kept on asking, like, what's your solution to solve this cost problem? And what I kept on getting was the same answer, which was this techno optimism that things were just ultimately going to work themselves out as they scaled you know these these protein problems are just going to go away and i kept on getting this answer over and over again and it made me very concerned because when i crunched the numbers on these proteins i wasn't convinced that this problem was just going to magically go away obviously economies of scale are, are true and things do get cheaper but there's a limit to how cheap you can make these proteins because they're made in genetically modified microbes that have to be grown up in these massive vats that then need to be purified and QC tested and cold chain transported. There's this whole ecosystem to provide these proteins. And, and re really quick to stop you, can you give us a quick one or two liner about where these recombinant proteins are used in the sure. cell culture process? Sure. So if you want to grow cells, they need certain signaling pathways to be activated in order to grow. And the traditional way that people have activated those signaling pathways is using what people refer to as recombinant proteins. They are molecules that activate certain signaling pathways and certain sets of proteins are used for stem cell proliferation. Other sets of proteins are used for stem cell differentiation. They're kind of like, like cocktails, different cocktails for different functions. These proteins are super expensive. And it's one of the reasons why cultured meat is so expensive and not on shelves right now. Are most of these proteins animal free or not? So there's different ways to derive them. Most of the ones that scientists use come from genetically engineered microbes that have been engineered to produce them. 
So then these different types of cocktails, so to speak, say cells do this. And then right. next time cells do that. Exactly. Right? Okay, cool. So then I went from this place of extreme optimism about cultured meat in general and wanting to get a job at a cultured meat company back into a depression where it was like, oh God, maybe all these cultured meat companies are going to die because these traditional ways of growing cells may not be able to scale. And even if they can scale, maybe they won't be able to get into the super price sensitive markets. So basically where I was at was that I was pretty convinced that cultured meat companies will be able to get into the Dominique Krenz of the world where you know people are dining for $400 a head. The amount of innovation that you need to do to get to a price point where you can serve at a restaurant like that is not that much. But I was highly skeptical that these companies were ever going to be able to get into the super price sensitive markets, you know, in sub-Saharan Africa or India or China, where the majority of the demand and growth is coming. Like, are they ever going to be able to get to a price point that can compete there? And that was the, the root of my concern. So then I started thinking about whether there could be a different way to grow cells, one that would not require any of these proteins at all. And that led me to the idea for prolific machines. I also realized that the skills that I would need to try and do that were skills that I did not have. <laughs> so then it start, I started a multi-year journey while I was finishing my PhD just to try and find co-founders. And it took me three years to find co-founders that I felt were good enough to embark on this with. Eventually, I met two incredible people. One of them is Max Heisman, who is a super talented physicist, incredible at building novel hardware. And the other was Declan Jones, who's an incredible machine learning engineer. And together we embarked on a, on a crazy journey. We actually applied to IndieBio on a whim where we were kind of had this Slack thread going. And I was like, I think we should apply to IndieBio. And I remember like Max and Declan were like, yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure we're ready, blah, blah, blah. And I just did it anyway without telling them. I just applied to IndieBio. Right. And, then, <laughs> and then within 24 hours, we got an email from IndieBio being like, oh, we want to meet you guys. I was like, holy shit. <laughs> Have you guys like uh, even like incorporated the company? No, we hadn't point? incorporated the company. It, it was kind of like a Slack channel. You had that spent years like finding these guys and talking about the technology. Yeah, all we had was a Slack channel. That, wow. was, that okay. was the extent. A Slack channel and a, a paper plan. And then we met Poe at IndieBio, who was really like a, it was a turning point in, in our lives. Poe's a crazy guy, and we are all a bit crazy too, so we just hit it off immediately with Poe and... He wired us money without even meeting us in person. We were on the other side of the world. I was like, wow, this crazy dude just wired us like $50,000. You were in London. Were your co-founders also in London? <laughs> well, yeah, I was in London. Declan was in the Bay Area. And my co-founder, the other co-founder, Max, was in Massachusetts. So we were in different parts of the world. It you was... guys are probably like, oh, shit, we have to incorporate it. <laughs> yeah. Right? So bank accounts are like... Start the company. Yeah, and I remember being like Googling, like, oh, how do you incorporate a company? I was like, <laughs> choose Delaware. I was like, huh, never been to Delaware. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, I like this. So the name of the company is Prolific Machines. Right. Why Prolific Machines? Poe actually came up with the name for Prolific Machines. We had a terrible name before that. We were called Gaia Labs, which is, I don't know what, what the hell we were thinking. Poe's policy on startup names is that every name should be able to double up as a nightclub. That's what <laughs> that's how he likes thinking about it. So he was like, prolific machines, it's super cool, super edgy. And we were like, whatever, man, it's better than Gaia Labs. <laughs> I like it. I like it. I'm just thinking like if there was a club called Memphis Meats, right, it would it would definitely be like whiskey cocktails and a side of like barbecue. So yeah, that's Poe's policy on startup names. Very cool. So when did you guys come over to San Francisco? It was in the height of the pandemic, October 2020. No one had been vaccinated. None of our batch mates were coming into the country. I got a national interest exemption and I arrived to an empty basement. And I'd never been to the Tenderloin or downtown San Francisco before. So this was quite the shock for me. I was like stepping over human shit on my way to work. <laughs> and I was like, oh, wow, this is what startup life is like in the Bay Area. <laughs> Were you ever like, what have I just committed to? Almost every day. Okay. <laughs> wow. Okay. So then you guys, all three of you come to IndieBio right. and you start building. So 
how did you guys overcome that problem? Yeah. What are you guys building? So the first iteration of cultured meat companies were not reinventing how cells were grown. They were taking, they were borrowing techniques from the biopharmaceutical industry that had already shown that you can use these cocktails of chemicals and proteins to grow cells. And what the original cultured meat companies did was take those techniques and apply them to new cell lines from you know, chicken, pig, uh, cow, whatever. And that actually works pretty well if you don't care about cost and you just want to make a prototype to do your next funding round, which is what these companies have done. Uh, it works pretty well. It doesn't work super well if you want to make a product that can compete with factory farming on cost. And the reason is, as I described, these proteins are super expensive. And so we are trying to build a fundamentally new approach that allows these cells to be grown with zero proteins in the media. And if you can do that, then a lot of things that are currently impossible can become possible. One of them is affordable cultured meat, but there are a lot of other applications of this technology. Like we could make cell therapies affordable. We could do tissues for regenerative medicine. We could grow mammalian proteins and mammalian cells, which is currently not possible because mammalian cells are too expensive. Wow. Okay. And so are you guys and- going to end up selling meat product or are you guys going to be selling a technology to cultured meat companies? I'm open to doing both. Okay. So the way I look at it is that Regardless of which of those paths we want to take, the original set of things that we need to prove are the same, which is that this technology can work to make affordable, delicious meat products. And we're still in the process of proving that that is true. Once that's been proven, we can do both. We could go out and sell meat products, but I generally am an advocate of anything that's going to help us solve this climate problem. So if other companies want to use our technology, I'm completely open to letting them do letting them use it. You know, we'll, we'll give them a license. And if anyone is listening to this and you're interested, you can email me. I'm totally open to having those conversations. I originally founded this company as a B2B platform to help other cultured meat companies. But yeah, if they don't want it, I will totally just go ahead and commercialize it myself. Right now, the focus is just on the technology. Just We're just trying to prove that the technology can work. <laughs> and then once that has been proven, we can make it available to anyone who wants it. <laughs> I kind of want to ask you about this idea of techno-optimism. Right. And so it's definitely not like a, a great thing, but is that a bad thing for this industry? You know, seeing that we can really... We see reports where cell cultured meat, for example, is going to come to price parity with existing technologies. Like you mentioned, a lot of these technologies are for pharma and, you know, the output will be extremely expensive. We need to innovate. But do you think that that techno optimism has been a good thing because it leads people that otherwise would just kind of dismiss cultured meat to actually look into it? Or is it kind of a bad thing because we're kind of overhyping the market? Yeah, I think it's a super interesting question. I think that there are positives and negatives for sure. Generally speaking, I am an optimist. I think it's important that the world has optimists. If the world's going to shit, nobody wants to be with the person who's just said, like, I told you so, you know? (laughs) You want to be with the people who are, like, trying to find solutions to deal with the mess. So I think that's important. I also think it's important to be a realist and to rationally evaluate some of these ideas that are being put forward. With the cultured meat industry, I think the a certain amount of optimism was required to get it off the ground. And I have a huge amount of respect for the first generation of cultured meat companies that led the way. You know, the one that I'm thinking of now is like Upside and Finless and New Age. You know, I was like looking at them as a PhD student and I was incredibly inspired by what they're doing. And if it wasn't for them, I probably wouldn't be doing what I'm doing. So I have a huge amount of respect for the people that started those companies and I'd love to help them if I can. Very cool. And, you know, we are in a conference room now, right across from us, there was another conference room where, you know, we interviewed Brian Spears from New Age Meat. So Brian, if you're listening, we bumped into each other a couple of days ago, but (laughs) this is an exciting technology that I'm excited to chat with Dennis about. So it's been a year since you guys have been a little bit over a year since you guys have been to in San Francisco mm-hmm. at IndieBio. Where are you guys at now? Yeah, so we did our pre-seed with IndieBio. With the pre-seed money, we showed that we could grow human stem cells without TGF beta. Once we did that, we raised a 4.1 million seed from Mayfield. And the partner that led that round was Arvind Gupta, who's quite a famous 
uh, investor in Cultured Me. It's famously, you know, the first check into Memphis and Finless and New Age and all these companies. He might even um, be walking around here today, right? Yeah, he's probably around here somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then with the money from Arvind, we uh, started working on cow cells. So we generated lines from Wagyu, Angus, uh, Hereford, a bunch of different breeds. And then we showed that we could grow Wagyu stem cells without FGF2. And that was super exciting. And then using that data, we raised you know 30 plus million Series A from Breakthrough Energy Ventures, uh, which is Bill Gates' climate change fund. And all in this span of time. Yeah, we did it super quick. Wow. Yeah. Don't fuck around. <laughs> <laughs> the planet has no time to waste. Yeah. And that was super interesting because Breakthrough had previously taken the position that cultured meat was never going to work because they had done their own economic analysis and had come to the conclusions that I had come to, which is that, you know, these proteins are too expensive. It's not going to scale. And it was super interesting raising money from them because they are like known as being the most scientifically rigorous investors in the world. And they took a U-turn on cultured meat because of us. Right. Um, so they said, okay, maybe cultured meat can work, but only if, only if this company exists. And so that was great. The partner that joined our board, Cooper Rinsler, is amazing. And then since then, we put together a, a celebrity round with like, you know, some NBA players and actors and famous chefs and stuff like that. And that was really just to help with the public perception of cultured meat later down the line, because I don't think it's going to be trivial for us or for any cultured meat company to convince the public to buy these things. And I think bringing some of the key influences in the world on board will help. Had you ever raised money before? No. <laughs> what was like your, your playbook? I mean, I'm sure you had a lot of great advisors and mentors here at IndieBio, but what was the playbook? Like, how did you just jump in? Thinking differently is important. And having a team that can execute quickly is important. Like, we were lucky in that the team that had been assembled like it took me a long time to assemble the founding team, but once it had been assembled, we were all technical. So like I was in the early days doing all the biology, Max was doing all the hardware development, Declan was doing all the software development. Then we brought on uh, Victor, who was a super talented synthetic biologist, Emily, who was a super talented material scientist, and Monique, who was a super talented cell biologist. And then like as a, as a group of six people, we had all of the skills that we needed to do the proof of concept. And I think a lot of startups when they start, don't have all the people that they need. And so they spend a lot of time just looking for those people. But we were lucky that from the very beginning, we'd assembled an extremely competent technical team and we could just execute in a way that a lot of people can't. When you're approaching these like celebrity investors, is it you know showing the use case of what cultured meat could be? Or is it showing the hardware and saying this hardware is solving XYZ problems? My experience with rich people generally is that they don't really care about the technical details. I think they care about like two things, broadly speaking. One of them is becoming more rich. And the, <laughs> and the, the second one is feeling good about themselves. And I think that investing in cultured meat can achieve both of those things. I love this. And I love on this show, at least we never talk about like investors like that. But at the end of the day, like that's the finance part of it, right? Mm -hmm. And that is finance to, to grow wealth. So interesting. How big is your team now? Including all the new hires we've made, we've got 16. 16, okay. And you guys are probably going to catapult that to a pretty huge number, right? Yeah, I'm actually a fan of moving quickly, but hiring slowly. I think there's this fallacy that, you know, more people equals more output. And I don't think that that's the case. Um, it can be the case, but often it's not because there's this communication efficiency problem that you add more people, more people need to talk to more people and it can cause problems. But yeah, I'm super, like the biggest hurdle I think for us was assembling a team that is extraordinary. And that's, I think, the most valuable thing that we have at Prolific. It's not the technology, it's not the IP, it's the group of people that's been assembled that's spectacularly talented. As you guys continue to grow, where will be like the landing spot for the headquarters? Will it be we're, in the Bay Area? Will it be in a different state, different country? We're, we're building a 20,000 square foot facility out in Emeryville, wow. uh, custom built for Prolific. Yeah, it's gonna be amazing. Why Emeryville? Honestly, there's not a lot of availability for 20,000 square foot facilities in the Bay Area. 
downtown San Francisco is very scary to me. I'm still, I'm not from around here. I'm not really used to how crazy it is. So I like how, I like the East Bay because it's slightly less crazy. And yeah, we're in the the old Jelly Belly factory, which is pretty oh, interesting. I think I see I, signs for that sometimes. Yeah. yeah. So my experience of touring lab facilities in the Bay Area was that it's just like, Vanilla building after vanilla building. It's they're so boring. It's just these gray blocks and they're so uninspiring. And all of our team at Prolific are super weird. And we kind of wanted a building that was also a bit weird because that reflects our culture. And I saw this old Jelly Belly factory. It's a completely ridiculous building. It's like a Willy Wonka factory. It has like weird pillars and high ceilings. And, you know, it, it, it's just so much fun. And when I saw it, and I, I was there with my team, and all of us just fell in love immediately. And we spent this whole day touring other places. Like, none of us gave a shit about any of the other places after you seeing knew. this place. Yeah, we put a bit on the same day, signed the LOI same day. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> I, I will say, like, hearing the company name, Prolific Machines, and then thinking, like, Willy Wonka-esque, like, it, it's <laughs> starting to tie together. <laughs> Very cool. And so... You guys have been in stealth for a long time. Right. And now that you guys are opening up to the public, mm -hmm. what can people expect from Prolific Machines? We want to accelerate the transition to cultured meat. However, we can do that best. That's what we want to do. If that's providing our technology to other cultured meat companies, if they want it, we'll do that. If it's selling cultured meat products ourselves, we can do that. It can be a combination of those two things. And... If somebody wanted to join your team, are you guys looking for specific roles? Is there a specific background that might be a good fit? I mean, in my mind, I'm thinking like if I could work at a company that is Willy Wonka-esque, then I would pretty much want to join any role there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, we're growing super quick. I am super interested in meeting anyone who is extremely passionate about this mission. If you're a scientist, if you're an engineer, if you're a business person, if you want to eliminate animal agriculture and move to a more trans uh, sustainable system, you should email me. I'm on dennis at prolific-machines.com. Email me, we can talk. I'm super interested to meet anyone that wants to participate. And yeah, excited to come out of stealth. Great, well, Dennis, thank you so much for being on the Cultured Meat and Future Food Show. Thanks for having me. This is your host, Alex, and we look forward to seeing you on the next episode. This program was produced by H Media. See you soon.